Hello and welcome. I'm Peter Anfrasiabi and I filmed this program a couple of years ago, The Art of Persuasion. I've reviewed it and I can confirm it is still current, so please enjoy. They're a most unlikely pair. One, a European rock star in his leather and sunglasses, whether inside or out, pushing for American tax dollars to go to worldwide AIDS relief. The other, a conservative traditional senator from the South who had spent a lifetime opposing foreign aid, cutting government spending on social programs, and who had shown little if any sympathy for AIDS victims. Bono and Senator Helms disagreed on many things, but Bono needed Helms. Bono believed the AIDS relief bill currently being held up in the Senate could save millions of lives and Helms was a primary roadblock. Bono needed Helms to end his opposition to the bill, so he decided to appeal to Helms directly. In this tense moment in Senator Helms' offices, Bono sat down across from Senator Helms to make his pitch. Bono opened his Bible, and he discussed with the senator the parable of Jesus helping the lepers. Bono explained that the modern-day AIDS crisis was like leprosy 2,000 years ago, a terrible disease that had caused victims to be discarded by that ancient society, but Jesus taught victims needed love, kindness, and support. Reportedly, Senator Helms cried as a leather-clad rock star spoke to him of this ancient story. The results were shocking and life-changing. Helms not only ended his opposition, but he actually signed on as a co-sponsor of the bill and even drafted an op-ed in a major newspaper to argue for the bill's passage. And it passed. And when it passed, the president noted that Helms' efforts were critical. And that was true. But it was also true that the fundamental change began with Bono whose efforts at persuasion were successful and had real-world consequences. Had Bono never met with Helms, the world would have been a very different place for millions of people. So the question is how Bono succeeded on his mission of changing the world. That is the story of how persuasion works. And he used two cardinal principles, storytelling and credibility. He used a powerful story that connected with his audience, one that fit within his audience's worldview, to move the listener to agree. And he used principles of credibility. Helms was a prominent Christian, and now his political positions were being challenged as inconsistent with his personal religious values. Just as Jesus stood up to his time's ignorance of the disease, so too now Senator Helms could do the same and stand up to our time's ignorance of a different disease. Bono connected because of the story, the story he used, and because of credibility. The credibility of the story and the speaker and of the audience. He was tested then to demand fidelity to that story. And that's the art of persuasion, and that's where storytelling and credibility can win the day. Not all of us have millions and millions of lives riding on our advocacy efforts, but many of us have millions of dollars for our clients riding on them, or our client's life or liberty. And it's what clients pay for when they buy us. They think they're buying our ability to persuade. Now we know persuasion is not magic. We've all been disappointed by results we believe were wrong or unfair, which is another way of saying lawyers, we know there's no dark art of persuasion that lets us brainwash people to do whatever we want. Persuasion instead is a learned skill. We must understand how people think, how they exercise judgment, how they make decisions. We must understand the process of persuasion, the role of logic and emotion, the importance of stories, and the centrality of credibility. So let's get going on today's program. What is persuasion? Is it art? Is it science? Or is it a bit of both? I think it's a bit of both. And what we'll be looking at today is the art of persuasion, the tools that you can use to persuade better, and we'll be looking at the science side of it also. Of course, it's a three-legged stool that we've all learned from our law school days, ethos, pathos, and logos. It comes from the ancients, from Aristotle. Ethos, of course, is the personal character of a speaker as perceived by the audience. How did Senator Helms perceive Bono? Persuasion by logic is what is the leg of the stool is known as logos from Aristotle. And persuasion by emotion is pathos. Now, another way of saying pathos, logos, and ethos is to say to please, to prove, and to move. And you see here a quote from our, another great ancient advocate, perhaps the greatest ancient advocate in history, Cicero. His quote is to prove as a matter of necessity, to please, through the exercise of charm, and to move as the source of victory. To please is ethos, to prove is logos, and to move 
is pathos. This three-legged stool is what we are going to unpackage today as we learn the art of persuasion, and we really do lend brilliance to your style, to my style, to all of our styles. So here are the issues we're covering today in order to achieve that goal of lending brilliance. We're gonna look at ethos, pathos, and logos, so to please, to prove, to move. We're gonna look at it in the modern world, the modern world of lawyering, where emotion, credibility, and logic, legal arguments matter. We're gonna unpackage storytelling and credibility. We're gonna unpackage the issue of knowing your audience. We're gonna look at inductive and deductive reasoning. We're gonna look at word choice and the importance of word choice and word pacing. We'll touch on some analogies, metaphors, some schemes and tropes. And we'll also pivot and look at the science of persuasion, some of the science and literature coming out of sociology and psychology fields that talk about what persuades people, what moves people to make decisions. And fundamentally, we are figuring out how we can all be the best person we are, being the best you. Along the way, we'll give some tips. And at the very end of the program, I'm going to talk to you about some do's and don'ts in the post-COVID technology age where so much of our future now is gonna be mediated by the screen that you're looking at when you're talking to the judge on a motion or on a status conference or you're attending a mediation over Zoom. We're gonna look at some technology tips, some do's and don'ts to effectively persuade via this medium when you're not in person. Let's start with Cicero though. And you see here on the slide a picture of the great order from history. And we're going to talk about two pole stars that fundamentally distill from his many key principles. His ancient work, De Oratore, translated on the ideal order, looks at several different um, characteristics and traits that you as an advocate need to have in order to be an effective advocate. So the first is knowledge. And what that means for us today is you have to know the law you're dealing with. You have to know the facts in your record. And that is something that you can do by spending time, by mastering the case law, by mastering the facts of your record, by not taking shortcuts and approaching the legal cases that are relevant to your dispute. Don't treat them at a high level. Don't just look for a good quote in a case, yank out the quote out of context and think you're off and running. Unpackage the law, unpackage and know your facts. That's the most basic foundational precept of advocacy. We have to have that knowledge. Because if we don't actually spend the time to properly know the law and the facts, we actually damage our ability to then use our advocacy skills and we hurt our credibility. He, Cicero also spoke of word choice and arrangement. Use words carefully. Don't oversell, don't overstate. And that's how you make your advocacy persuasive. These lessons from the ancients matter today. And we've all experienced the time in court where Perhaps we overstated or oversold something, or the other side did, and it's the bomb going off in the courtroom, right? Everyone recognizes, ouch, you went too far, the judge leaps all over you or over your opposing counsel, or you're given an opportunity to point out their hyperbole and how it doesn't work. So your word choice and arrangement in your written work product and in your oral advocacy is critical, and that takes practice. In the words of Churchill, practice, practice, practice. You have to have emotional knowledge. This is the third um, core pole star coming from principle coming from Cicero. And that is that your word choice has to appeal to the right emotion, to explain, to justify, to dispute something. But to do this, you have to be aware of the emotional impact of your words on others. And what this goes to fundamentally for us in the modern world is bad word choice is an audience issue. If you stand up before the judge and say, Everything the other side has said is clearly wrong, that they clearly don't understand what's going on, they're being disingenuous. You are using word choices that run the risk of damaging your credibility with your audience. Finally, voice inflection, the tone of your voice, the pacing and pattern of your speech can be used to emphasize. That can be a critical way to get the listener's attention, whether it's a judge or perhaps a jury. All of these things can be distilled as attributes of two major precepts for lawyers today. And these are the two precepts we're going to start talking about, and that is storytelling and credibility. How do you tell an effective story? Why do you need to tell an effective story? And how do you get, maintain, and hold on to your credibility? So let's look at storytelling. And storytelling, if you unpackage it from the ancients to today, what we're talking about is pathos, or in the words of Cicero, to move. And let's look here on this next slide at 
one of some of the most famous words from history, once upon a time. Once upon a time, it's a magic phrase. It's magic not because of its meaning, necessarily, as the phrase tends to be unnecessarily long and verbose even. After all, if you wanted to say once upon a time, you could almost always cut out once upon a time or some of those words and retain all of the substance that you're trying to convey. In other words, there's a shorter way to say that. But why do we do it? Everything that follows is magical and important. But why? This phrase is magical, not because of what it means then, but because of what it signals. For this reason, you could use a variation of the phrase and achieve the identical result, the identical effect. But it turns out we don't use the identical phrase all the time, do we? Just about every language, as it turns out, has its own version of once upon a time. In some cultures and languages, it's once there was, some say there was once, and those are common versions across many, many languages. In Japanese, as you see here on the slide, it's mukashi, mukashi, long ago, long ago. Or, you want to come to the more modern world? How about these recent English versions? A long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. A long, long time ago. I can still remember how that music used to make me smile. Why do we use these phrases? Well, for thousands of years, before George Lucas coined his famous intro to Star Wars or before Don McLean's great song, even before the written word, humans, our ancients, they were master storytellers. It's how they taught. It's how they corrected. And for us today, it's how they persuaded. Now much has obviously changed about the world from the time of the ancients until now. But even now, no matter how boring the speaker, no matter how disinterested you may be listening to me, I'm boring and you're disinterested, if a speaker says to you, once upon a time, heads are gonna pop up. Your head will pop up, you'll bounce out of wherever you were daydreaming, and you'll pay attention. Why? Because a story is coming. But something has happened to those of us in the legal profession. Part of that's law school. Law school is where you take a group of really, really, really smart people. We all are, aren't we? But we've never practiced law. And then you take another group of really, really smart people, the professors, who've never practiced law either by and large, or barely practiced law. And they then train us how to practice law. And part of that training, if we remember what was going on in law school, is to hammer the humanity out of us to teach us to think and communicate, as they say, quote unquote, like a lawyer. Now, what we're not trained to do is to think and communicate like people, like human beings telling stories. We have frameworks and elements and causes of action, and we fit the facts into those rubrics. But those aren't stories. And so this whole class of people who are paid really well to teach us how to be lawyers are not working fundamentally with the most basic tool that even everyday cavemen knew how to tell a story. That's why when you look at this slide, we have to stay focused on the fact that our job as advocates is to tell your client's litigation story all the time. Or if you're not an advocate in court, perhaps you're a transactional lawyer, you're still an advocate for your client's deal, for their negotiation, for their movie pitch, whatever it may be. And your job is to advocate, it's to tell a story. It's to fit your facts and your law into that framework of a story. And this is why stories are so important. And this is why part of what is lost in law school, and then it's lost in the beginning years as we practice law, is this ability to really focus on and recognize how do you tell a story? How do you take these elements and facts and jury instructions and these math near mathematical rubrics and convert them to passionate stories? And why do we do it? Well, we need to do it because of the transformative nature of stories. Explaining and connecting these rules, these elements in our causes of action, the rules that are governing you know, the legal dispute that we're in, how we explain and connect those to persuasive reasons for the rules, to transform what may be the harshness or the seeming arbitrariness of the rule and the outcome, to transform that to a necessary or proper one, that's what storytelling does. It bridges that function of connecting the rules to a result in a coherent real-world fashion.
that's compelling. So let's shift from storytelling to credibility. Credibility, it affects, as you see here on our slide, all aspects of lawyering. Now, many aspects are going to differ, obviously. We write letters, we do discovery, we take depositions, we file motions, we write mediation briefs. And when I say we, we as litigators. But we also send letters to opposing counsel if you're a transaction lawyer. You negotiate, you sit across a room and try to hammer out a deal. And we have to think of all of these different things that we do as being functionally, imagine that they are like tools. And they all have the same color handle, just as when you go down to the Home Depot and a particular brand of tool, they've got 20, 30, 40 different tools. And you can tell they're all at the same brand because they're color coded in the same way. They have a red handle or an orange handle or a yellow and blue color scheme, whatever that is. And so you know, they're all different tools, but they all fall under one roof. Well, that unifying color, using that metaphor, that unifying color is a credibility. Our credibility sits on top of every one of those tools. And here you see on the slide another quote from Cicero. All my efforts are always concerned with this goal, for I will say it again and again, to do some good by my speaking if I can, and if not, at least to do no harm. That's a fantastic quote to keep in mind. Keep that in mind in terms of the story of credibility. We must be credible and try to do good by our speaking, but by the same token, if we are going to do harm by overstating or by misrepresenting facts, for example, then do the least harm, speak less, maintain your credibility. And so this is the point. Overselling or overstating things, the constant charge that we see in litigation that the other side is disingenuous, that they're outrageous, they're frivolous, they're clearly wrong. These types of trigger words that we always hear from all the judges, trigger them. Well, those are the types of words that can actually do harm. And they're driven though by a desire to do, to do something. But when we oversell, we then damage our credibility. It's a boomerang. So I think the one thing to keep in mind when we're thinking about credibility is that Cicero's do no harm mantra, that's still key today. Now you see on the next slide, we're going to talk about another aspect of credibility, and that is the idea that compromise is not weakness. Yes, let's say it again. Compromise is not weakness. Part of the problem that has afflicted the credibility of advocates in the modern world is that we push too many arguments all the time in the case. We don't drop weak arguments because lawyers are trained to be like pit bulls, right? We come up with 19 different causes of action to explain the fundamental transaction that went wrong because remember, that's what we were trained to do in law school. The smartest students with the best grades and a little hypothetical fact pattern saw 22 causes of action, right? So we continue on with that. And what happens is we make weak arguments and we are then fearful to concede and let go of any of those. But the better path to advocacy I would submit to have credibility before your opposing counsel, who you want to have credibility with. At some point, you want to eventually try to settle the case and maybe get them to pay money to your client. You want to build a rapport and have credibility. By the same token, the judge, you want credibility. And by the same token, before the jury, you want credibility. And so better advocacy is not always more arguments. You can actually gain credibility by making concessions. And this is true in your briefs, your motion, your jury work, your transactional work, your deal arguments that you're making. And so what I would submit is that we should see concessions as gifts. It's a gift to you as an advocate. It's an opportunity to give something to someone else and then expect something back in return. And so a good concession lost is a lost gift. And we're gonna talk in a little while about the science behind the art of persuasion. And there's a, the science backs up the idea that gifts and this idea of reciprocity is critical. And so when we take the idea of giving and then people being obliged to give back and we transport it to the litigation realm, one of the currencies that we can use to track that reciprocity is making a concession of a weak point to gain credibility. So let's look at a real world example on this slide. And this, is <clears throat> this ties to the idea of making too many arguments. It's the credibility in pressing legal arguments. And here we have a quote from the US Supreme Court from Justice um, Robert Jackson in the 1950s. And here's his quote. Legal contentions, like the currency, depreciate through overissue. That's such a fantastic turn of phrase too. The mind of an appellate judge is habitually receptive to the suggestion that a lower court committed an error. But receptiveness declines as the number of assigned errors increases. 
Multiplicity hints at a lack of confidence. Multiplying assignments of error will dilute and weaken a good case and will not save a bad one. Now, what's he talking about here? He is talking, of course, in the context of appellate litigation, of pushing too many arguments of error below, of going up on appeal and saying the trial court did 19 different things wrong. The more you push errors, the more the mind of the judge sees multiplicity, and so the receptiveness to the idea that there could be an error starts declining. That exchange rate exists in all litigation. Exists, it's not just an appellate exchange rate, it's a trial court exchange rate. It's a jury exchange rate in terms of pressing too many inconsistent theories or too many theories. And so thinking about this quote, maintaining this quote in your mind is really critical. And you can see on the next slide here, I've taken the quote and turned it into an actual currency of credibility chart to sort of look at this mathematically if, if you're a science and math person. And what you see here is the more assignments of error, the less the court's receptivity to any given error exists. But if you want a higher judicial receptivity to error, a higher likelihood that the error you're asserting, the flaw in the other side's case, the mistake that was made below, the error made by the other side that led to your client's harm, for example, the higher the receptivity requires a lower number of arguments and assigned errors. So it's a simple mathematical formula that Justice Jackson's quote gives. And what it really means is that by limiting your arguments, that's a concession itself. It shows that one is narrowly focused and thus you have credibility on the right footing out of the gate. Now let's turn to logic, to proper reasoning, proper logic, to persuading the use of logos, as Aristotle said, or to prove from Cicero. Logic permits us to identify strengths and weaknesses. Our arguments, of course, are better when grounded in logic and sound reasoning. The two fundamental tools of logic are deductive and inductive reasoning, which we as lawyers use all the time. But we need to know what they are. We need to know how to use them to build tighter arguments and how not to leave ourselves exposed by building weak arguments and to find ways to expose the weakness of the other side's argument. Here's another quote. This is from a famous Third Circuit judge, Judge Aldisert, and this is from his article, Logic for Lawyers, A Guide to Clear Legal Thinking. And it's built around the idea that the judicial system is rooted in logic. And here's Judge Aldisert's quote. The person who studies logic, law student, lawyer, or judge, and who has become familiar with the principles of logical thinking is more likely to reason correctly than one who has not thought about the general concepts of reasoning. Now, we all, of course, know this. This is what we do as lawyers. But what's often happened is that the resort to logic has been lost in terms of the art form of using it and using it properly and carefully. It's glossed over all too much in the perception that in the real modern world of decision making and judicial realism that all that really matters sometimes is the idea that, you know, what's the story, what's the injury, and how am I going to sell this at a high level? But it's not the case. We have to stay grounded in principles of logic. So this requires us to do a little quick refresher on deductive and inductive reasoning. And so let's look here at deductive logic, which is sometimes known as formal. Um, and deductive reasoning draws specific conclusions from general premises. And of course, this is basically syllogisms. The you know, famous known syllogism is all men are mortal, Peter's a man, therefore Peter is mortal. And so we have a major premise, we have a minor premise, and we have a conclusion. And the deductive reasoning and deductive logic tells you that the conclusion is true if both premises are true. But if a premise is false, then the syllogism breaks down and your logic is flawed. What we often also do in lawyering is we use major premises that are hypotheticals. And so a major premise can be a hypothetical. And so here's, for, here's a you know, typical example. The major premise is that if the plaintiff filed more than one year from injury, the statute of limitation bars the action. The minor premise is the plaintiff filed two years after injury. The conclusion is that the plaintiff is time barred. Now we have a hypothetical major premise. The conclusion is true if both premises are true, but, and this is an important but, this conclusion to be true hinges on the accuracy of the hypothetical major pr premise. And of course, the discovery rule could exist to break that logic, and then your opponent will have a counter syllogism that defeats you. Of course, major premises can be implied in arguments too. 
And the major lesson here that I think that's so important is to use syllogisms accurately and carefully. Be aware of the assumptions that are built into your syllogisms and be aware of the potential errors that are built into them and be as narrow as possible with syllogisms. So here's another example. All licensed lawyers take CLE. Peter's a licensed lawyer. The conclusion, therefore, is that Peter has taken CLE. Now that conclusion is true if both of the premises are true. But I may have created a premise for you that is a little ambiguous, it's a little vague. It's true all licensed lawyers are supposed to take CLE. And it's true that all licensed lawyers fill out forms that report they've taken CLE. But it doesn't necessarily mean that all licensed lawyers in fact took CLE. We may have just lied. You may not be watching here today, right? You're, you're paying attention to something else and you're not really here, but you're going to sign at the end of the program that you listen to the program, right? When we understand then how you can take apart syllogisms and the assumptions that are in them, we can unpackage a legal argument and we can break it down. And we can see the fallacies in the argument to come up with a tighter one, which perhaps you could then, if, it, if that syllogism mattered, the all licensed lawyers take CLE, you would change the major premise to get to the conclusion you want. All licensed lawyers report that they have taken CLE, and then you'd have a more accurate syllogism. So the fundamental lesson is to use your, your syllogisms accurately and to be aware of the assumptions that creep into them. Let's now shift from deductive to inductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning is sometimes known as informal logic, and inductive reasoning posits that we go from specific facts to broader general conclusions. So, we are seeking a conclusion not limited to its premises, which was of course deductive reasoning, but rather as an inference from the specifics. And so what we're often talking about here is causation and arguments by analogy and where we're connecting a specific set of facts to a broad conclusion that we want to follow. So causation is the perfect example where we connect an effect to a perceived cause. So if X happens, Y follows. And so you can think you know, of the most basic example being the floor is slippery, the person slipped and injured themselves, the injury flows from the slippery floor, right? And that's the causation between the two that we're trying to connect. Now, the issues, of course, that are critical when we're making these causal connections from two events and trying to discern if we have causation or just a correlation between two things, the issue that's critical is we have to be careful that we don't assume that chronology equals causation. That just because something came first means that the thing that came second was caused by the thing that came first. So if you assume chronology is causation, that's risky ground to be on. We also have to recognize that simply assuming a relationship between two events can be risky. We have to then use logic to unpackage why those two events, the slippery four and the injury could be the example, whatever X is, whatever Y is, we have to figure out what is the relationship between X and Y that explains why the chronology does yield causation as opposed to just happenstance. Another example of inductive um, logic and reasoning is arguing by analogy. And this is where, of course, we compare a known observed event to our event with the conclusion that therefore the known event's outcome must control here. And of course, the most common use of this kind of reasoning is the common law case law method that we use and argue all the time in our briefs and our arguments where we try to say that you know these five cases on these fact patterns came out this way and so those are known observed events and so therefore our case should come out the same way because its facts are, the, are similar or the same. And these are um, common law development arguments. They're figurative ones that we make for oral arguments to judges and juries. And the critical point here is that we have to very, very carefully identify what the relevant points of similarity are and the relevant points of dissimilarity and the arguments for each. And so the key lesson, I think, to remember here in terms of becoming more brilliant as an advocate yourself, to how you can better lend brilliance to your style, is to pay attention to the dissimilarities. They matter. You can't just focus on your strengths and why your case is like those other five cases for these six reasons, which are, may all be true and they're important. You have to focus on the dissimilarities. And to not pay attention to the dissimilarities actually dilutes your cause and your causes, and it causes you perhaps to misappreh misapprehend the value of the other side's argument, of their arguments, the strength of their arguments, so that you can better evaluate your case. And what happens all too often, we see it all the time in briefing, is 
a party leads with their best arguments, they ignore the bad stuff, the other side shoots back with all the, the stuff that's bad for you as a moving party, and then in reply it's kind of ignored and you just focus again on the good stuff, hoping somehow that those kind of bad facts out there that are bothering you are gonna, gonna just get lost into the ether by the court or something like that. That's not the better way to litigate. The better way to litigate, I think, to have credibility fundamentally in your legal reasoning is to incorporate, understand those bad facts, the dissimilarities between, you know, in your analogy and the other cases, um, the, the problems in your causation theory, but to understand them so that you can then have a logical explanation for them and to find a way to deal with them head on. Let's look now at some logical fallacy traps. Of course, the personal attacks known as ad hominems, you know, you call your opponent a liar, you know, that is a logical fallacy trap. Even if the opposing lawyer is a liar or is disingenuous and is a terrible person, that doesn't mean that you win your case and that they lose their case. And so that becomes one of the logical fallacy traps that I think damages one's ability to be a more effective persuader. Red herrings are used to distract. I mean, you know, an, the example here is, you know, the argument that you know, if we allow flag burning, that'll encourage violence. Therefore, we should ban flag burning because there's going to be violence. We're using a red herring, this thing about violence, to distract from the real issue about, you know, is flag burning protected speech or not? Um, another example of a logical fallacy trap, which are, and these are things that we do in our own advocacy when we make mistakes. These are things that people do to us that we may or may not recognize and we need to unpackage. The other one is straw men. Um, we set up a false argument, we demolish it, and we do that in order to justify demolishing the real argument. And so, you know, here's an example. You have, for example, a copyright case where the plaintiff is suing the defendant, and the defendant, you know, you know, is arguing that um, latches should bar the plaintiff's copyright suit because the plaintiff waited too long to sue. And so, you know, you get up and you say that, well, the defendant argues latches, you know, and that's going to allow one to infringe a work. And so if that's the case, that the latches rule lets them infringe at will freely forever because, you know, plaintiff's out of luck, now we're telling the court that kind of an interpretation of this legal doctrine of latches means everyone's creative works, Steven Spielberg's movies, whatever, they can be stolen at will forever if they're just infringed long enough in some obscure location and no one knows. And that's not what the law envisions. And so therefore the rule can't be what the defendant says it is, right? So I've set up a straw man with, uh, you know, kind of a, a fake hypothetical that I'm able to effectively demolish because it doesn't make any sense. And what I'm doing is I'm abstracting away from my case and from my circumstances to try to get on terrain that I can win on and then backfill that into your case. That's an example of a straw man that we often use in our writing. Other side, the other side will use it against us. And you want to have your antenna up your antenna up and focused on when you are being subjected to a straw man argument. Because it's often very, very subtle in legal arguments and in the writing, and it can be overlooked. Now let's talk briefly about schemes and tropes and what they are and how they are tools in your art of persuasion toolbox. And these are rhetorical devices. And so we think of schemes as, and here are several examples of schemes. There are obviously more, but in classic um, rhetoric, these, these are some prominent schemes that we as lawyers at least use today. And that is, the first one is changing word variance order. And that, you know, a simple example could be, for example, if you're trying a case before a jury and instead of saying, Peter is a honest witness or Peter was an honest witness, and that's the point you want to make, you may change up that word variance by saying, an honest witness, Peter was, you saw that. And so we're getting out of the subject, verb, object, traditional way of writing or speaking, obviously, with a different variance of the words, which triggers in the listener attentiveness because it's atypical and they now have to pay attention to unpackage where you're going. And so that's used often. Another example is repeating phrases in rhythm to emphasize. And so the most famous example that, that pops into one's mind, obviously, at first could be um, Martin Luther King Jr.'s famous I Have a Dream speech, that repetitive use of I have a dream and then a few minutes later, I have a dream. That becomes a very powerful um, rhetorical device to persuade, and we can use that in our writing and in our oral advocacy by having certain distilled phrases that, that may be your theme of the case, or it may unpackage what's going on in your case, or a way you're dealing with the, other, the opposing side's discovery, intransigence, whatever it may be, you can use these repeat phrases effectively. You know, you figure out what the right phrase is for your situation, but you use it then 
in a repeated manner two, three, four times to emphasize a point. Another one, of course, is pauses in speech. We're often talking and we're talking and yapping along like this, but when you pause and you have an emphasis on the, the final words coming out of your mouth, the listener perks up and wants to pay attention to what you're going to say next because that pause following the emphasized speech intonation tells the listener something important is coming. Pay attention. Stay on guard. Right? That's a perfect example of a, um, of, a, of a common scheme. Then, of course, in our writing, we can use you know, variants in our sentence structures and length. So instead of writing those traditional long you know, four-line sentences you know, that are near paragraphs to unpackage that, that so much legal writing often does, instead of having long, long sentences all the time that just take forever to read and understand, you break it up, you change it, you have very, very short sentences. And so a, cl a classic example that I use with my students, for example, in, in the clinic I teach at UCI Law School in our appellate um, advocacy clinic, is when writing their reply brief, we will re restate the opposing side's argument and say, you know, for example, the, uh, the government contends that our client should lose because of latches, right? We restate it in a long sentence, their argument. And then the next sentence may say, not so. Just those two words, not so, or this is not true, or this is wrong. A very short sentence like that, standing against a long sentence, is another good example of a scheme where you vary the sentence um, structure and length in a manner that draws the reader in and gets the reader to pay attention, and the eyes stop, and it's like the pause example. You pay attention a little bit more. It's another you know, rudimentary example of um, using a scheme effectively in writing. Tropes. <clears throat> of course, they're metaphors and similes. And so we use metaphors to compare, and that allows us to draw drama into the situation by comparing to another set of observable facts or a situation. Or we use similes, the as-like comparisons, when we're trying to you know, connect ourselves to a good body of case law that we want to plug our facts into. Those are valuable rhetorical devices. Or we even use rhetorical questions. Um, we can use ironic understatements, and this can be done when talking to a judge or a jury particularly, but it can also be done when one's taking a deposition. Um, ironic understatements or exaggerations that are used in, by the questioner to get the listener to buy into something or to point out the absurdity of, of their position, right? So it can be used very effectively in closing arguments for those reasons. Now, from schemes and tropes, we have to go back to our audience. Because all of these tools work if we're focused on who is our audience, what drives our audience, what animates our audience, and it depends. In our example in the beginning of Bono and Senator Helms, the audience for Bono was Senator Helms. Our audience, of course, may be the trial judge, could be a publicly appointed judge on the state or federal bench, maybe with lifetime appointment, maybe without. It could be a private arbitrator. It could be a trial court judge, it could be an appellate judge. It could be, your audience could be your opposing counsel, and it, can, and it can and always is your client too. So I think for litigators at least, we need to be very, very aware of the differences between courts to understand our audience. We have to unpackage the difference between trial courts, for example, and appellate courts. And we want to know the unique formalities that may be unique and present in each of the courts so that we're aware of our audience and so that we come out of the gate showing that we are aware of this forum we're in and we're aware of the expected decorum of the forum. So the perfect example is in the Court of Appeals, every time I stand up in front of the Ninth Circuit, the first words out of my mouth when I walk to the podium are, good morning and may it please the court. Now, in our trial court, we don't go and argue our discovery motion and go up to the podium and say, good morning, your honor, may it please the court. That's just not a formality that has ever been practiced in the trial courts and you'd be a little out of place if you did it. Not that you don't, can't if you don't want to, I suppose, but it'd be a little out of place. But you want to know your formalities, at least, so that you show up and you, and you telegraph by doing that, that you know who the audience is and you understand the court you're in. You're not just clueless showing up in the, in the court, not speaking the language of that court. Now, for jury work, of course, that's why focus groups, mock jury trials are used to test arguments. And my partner, Chris Arledge, and I, in our, in our cases here at this firm, we regularly, in, when he's getting ready for trial, get focus groups together um, from different places and you know, press the different arguments for one side and you know, he may press the case he's gonna try to the jury and I'll talk to the mock, the mock panel of people about 
the weaknesses of that argument and kind of do a presentation of the other side's argument. And these are very, very valuable um, things to do for us as lawyers to understand how non-lawyers who are just going to hear a set of facts and some general law, what resonates with them, what doesn't. And every single time we've done this work, we've always found that one or two things that we thought were sort of important, but maybe not that big a deal, are way more important, at least to the, the focus panel. And some of the things that we thought were just the biggest deal in the world don't resonate, don't matter, aren't even understood because they're still too legally abstract. And so knowing your audience is critical to sort of get yourself best prepared to be able to then stand up and make the best argument. Another perfect example is in, appellate, in the appellate realm. Um, if you're going to, to an appellate court, you need to understand that court. That court isn't concerned with, for example, the finding of facts, the way a trial court. The trial court's job is to find facts. The appellate court makes law for whole jurisdiction. And so you as an advocate have to understand now that you're standing before a panel of three judges who are generalist judges on the law, and their audience is more on creating harmony within the law and understanding the ripples that could flow from a bad precedent that they may have to issue. That's their focus. That's the systemic driver of that court, which is different to the systemic driver of a trial court. And this is why, for example, I always recommend and speak to many law firms about doing appellate moot courts. I'm often brought into different law firms to go and help prepare their appellate teams for oral argument, not by because somehow I could be smarter or better than them at knowing their case. I obviously can't and never will be. But what I can do is approach it as an appellate judge would approach it from that generalist principle you know, I've argued scores and scores of appeals myself. And so I can look at their briefs and, and then give positive feedback in terms of these arguments seem to work, these ones don't really work. And that lets them as appellate advocates, you as an appellate advocate, better fine tune your arguments as you're getting ready to go up for your you know, limited 10 or 20 minutes to talk to the panel. So the, la the last point here is to beware of localized phrases that may have no meaning elsewhere. And that's probably most important for those of you who are trial lawyers and you're traveling around the country and you want to make sure that you know a turn of phrase that may have meaning in Maine some you know you know you know phrase that may be related to the fishing industry or something that you know that's prevalent in Maine that everyone just by virtue of growing up in Maine knows you go and say that in a court in Texas or California people won't have the slightest idea of what you're talking about so just keep that in mind now let's go to word choice and we've talked about words before and you know, you see on the slide here, I put in the background a picture of some sheet music from, from um, Johann Sebastian Bach's, one of his um, symphonies. And it's important to tell you this point. In your word choice, do you want your words to be symphonic or do you want discordance to flow from your words? And so this, I think, is an overarching um, point that goes to pleasing, proving, and moving. You want to fundamentally spend time appreciating words and the style of words as used in writing Pay attention to what you read, whether it's a magazine, a blog, um, literature, Hemingway, whatever it is you may read. If you spend real time paying attention to the words and the word style that's used by others, this can be invaluable to improving your own writing and your own oral presentations. And so one example, I mean, this is just a simple one here, but you can think of you know, many of them, is if you're standing up before a jury and you're getting ready to, to start addressing damages, the plaintiff's lawyer could, could say, Ladies and gentlemen, let's turn to damages now. Or they, the plaintiff's lawyer could say, let's now assess the unfortunate pain. Now, they're both saying the same thing. They're both a, a marker to the jury that we are now going to this issue of damages and the suffering. But there's two different ways to say it, and one is more powerful, I would submit, than the other. Finally, and this is a really important point, practice, practice, practice. Winston Churchill did. The reason I put Churchill here in particular, but so did many famous orators from history. You go back to the ancients, they practiced endlessly to be the best oral advocates they could be. But I use Churchill for this reason. We all have, have seen and heard or read Churchill's speeches and marvel at his you know, ability to be so brilliant with his, with his tongue and the extemporaneous manner in which he's able to just get up and start talking and say the most profound, amazing things, right? In his speeches and his, you know, blood, toil and sweat speech. I mean, all the speeches from World War II, for example. But what is known to those who have studied Churchill in detail and read his biographies is that he practiced endlessly, endlessly. And it was at practice. He practiced so much that he was able to make you think that he was just speaking off the cuff in this amazing manner such that he was possessed by this ability to be an artist as an advocate in a way that none of us ever could do. 
but it was practice that got him there, and it's practice that can make all of us better advocates. And so I think these tools, therefore, are learnable skills. They make this art form of persuasion something that you can do, but also now let's shift from the art form side to the science side. And so here, I'm going to talk to you about seven cornerstones of the science of persuasion. And this comes from Robert Caldini's book, Influence the Psychology of Persuasion. It's an absolutely fantastic book. I tell everyone to read it when I speak to, to groups on persuasion. And he talks about these seven cornerstones, reciprocity, scarcity, authority, consistency, likability, consensus, and unity. For many, many years, his book, had, his book had six, but he's added a seventh one to unity in the last several years. And these are not persuasion techniques for lawyers, per se. They're just generally built around the psychology of persuasion, how you influence other people in all manner of um, walks of life. But for us as lawyers, we can use them. So briefly, just to walk through Caldini's um, seven cornerstones of persuasion, the first one is reciprocity. This is the idea that giving favors or assistance, compliments, whatever it may be, you give something to someone else and that person feels compelled to return it. And so the most common example, of course, is you know, you're given you know, free tastes of food in the grocery store when you're in Costco or whatever. They have those booths set up letting you have food for free. The theory behind that is not just because they really care about you tasting it, but it's the idea that you're being given something. And, it's, and in return, we, at, a, at a sort of subtle psychological level, when given something, we're obligated to give back. And the, and the give back may be then buying the product. Um, for us as lawyers, of course, the example that I've spoken about already, and, and here we say it again, is you can make it concessions um, to enhance your cred credibility, and that's a gift. You are giving the other side, the judge, the opposing counsel, the other par party to your deal transaction, a concession where you may say, I agree that my argument on latches is not the strongest argument, but what you're doing by conceding a weak argument is getting the person to then accept, to recognize that, wow, you have credibility, you know your audience, you have credibility, and what you're hoping by making a concession is you're giving a gift, you're agreeing. But then what you want to tell them is, by the same token, you have to agree that my statute of limitations argument is stronger. And that's definitely the art of deal making for you transactional lawyers when you're doing your deals and you're fighting over all the different deal points. There are things that you can give up to the other side and to try to help them feel compelled to then give up on something to you. And that kind of back and forth is the reciprocity that Caldini talks about. Scarcity is his other principle and that is of course the concept that the more uncommon something is, the more valuable it is. Um, and for us as lawyers, of course, it's our services. I mean, the more uncommon they may be, the um, you know, you know, you're a hyper-specialized lawyer who specializes in sort of Bitcoin transactions or whatever it may be, that makes that scarcity makes you more valuable. Um, you know, a common way that we use this in damages scenarios, of course, is that, you know, your damages are a function of a loss of something. And if the thing lost is scarce, that's all else being equal better than if what got lost or damaged is just some commoditized object. So we look to sort of find ways to paint the damages, the injury, the losses, the, the lost business opportunities, whatever they may be, as a loss of something scarce as opposed to a pure commodity. Authority is his other principle, and that is that the more authority and experience you have, specialized expertise, the more credible you are seen. And so what this is also saying is that you need, therefore, third parties to promote your brilliance as opposed to self-promotion, and that's the big difference. You know, self-promotion triggers instantly to the to the listener, the viewer, that it's self-promotion. It doesn't con connect to authority the same way others may promote your brilliance. Hence, you know, we get these things in the mail to have you know different organizations say that we're super lawyers and we have our capes and whatever it is we may have because those are third parties who are now promoting our brilliance, and that that authority then helps us as lawyers persuade more. Um, an example that's used in the trial court litigation a lot, um, this, this example is important, and that is third-party witnesses can be really, really valuable. If they, they don't have a dog in a fight, and so they can become particularly important bearers of truth, speakers of authority, because they don't have a dog in the fight. Of course the plaintiff says he was injured millions of dollars, he wants money. Of course the defendant says the plaintiff wasn't injured and nothing's wrong here because he doesn't want to pay money. So those third parties can be bearers of truth and have real authority about what happened or what's true. Consistency, and this is convincing people to act in a way consistent with their self-perception grows as becoming easier to sell ideas if they remain consistent. And so the example, of course, is that 
you should give juries simple and consistent explanations so that you can show consistency in your theory at the end. You simply want to remain consistent in how you present your case, how you promote it, what you say about it, so that you have credibility ultimately. Likeability is important, but the key point here is that becoming liked, you know, to become liked and do it in the right way is to be yourself. You can't fake it, and you need to do this before you try to influence or persuade others. But I think the most important point here that comes from Caldini's psychological research on the science of, of persuasion and likability is that you can't fake it. And this is really, really important, and I'll talk to you in a moment about examples with my students in terms of, for us as lawyers, understanding that we have to be better versions of ourselves. That's why in the very beginning of this program I said, I'm going to lend brilliance to your style. I'm not Cicero. I can't be Clarence Darrow. I can't be Abraham Lincoln. I have my own issues about who I am and how I am. But I can be the best version of myself and I can be the best advocate, even with limitations that make me you know, not be this sort of wonderful orator like Churchill or whoever it may be. Um, but if you try to fake it, if I try to make myself become a Winston Churchill, people will see I'm faking it. That's just what the science shows. You can't fake who you are and then you lose on the persuasion side if you're trying to fake it. Finally, or uh, penultimately, consensus. People look to conform to the norms of the group and they look to others in decision making. So if you think about like a common example you see in like hotels these days where they're trying to um, get us to conserve water and whatnot, the little note on the towel or on the door will say, eight, eight out of 10 people reuse towels. Think about the use of that instead of them saying, please reuse the towel so that you can save water. They say eight out of 10 reuse towels because that is a more effective way to get you to reuse your towel than telling you to do it to save the, the, the environment or whatnot. Why? Consensus, group thinking. Eight out of 10 people is more powerful because of the way we're wired. And of course then this goes to juries and how you want to understand juries are making their decisions working with consensus. The final um, point that Caldini's added to the psychology, the science side of this, is unity. And this is that a shared identity of the influencer and the influence E can be really powerful. It's bonding. So, you know, we're all Star Wars fans or we're all Lakers fans, whatever it may be, we define ourselves in a way that we put the influencer and the influence E together in the same um, unified group, and that makes us. Um, able to influence more. So the more people are like us, the more we will be persuaded by them. The more they are building something together, the more they will agree with you. So this is the idea of shared identity values. And so an example here is that you make your theory of the case something that the jury shares or some idea in your case is something that can resonate with the jury because we are unified and we have the, the same similar values. And so that's why one of the examples you often hear when you're dealing with sort of thefts or takings of and the need to then punish is this idea of, well, what do you do if the kid steals a cookie out of the jar? And we use that famous story and that metaphor, but it's because it resonates and it's unified with everyone. You'll have done your jury research and they have kids or they were kids and people understand the idea that someone who steals a cookie out of a jar um, has to have a punishment that follows if you want to have the right incentives. And if that's your theory of the case, or that could be a relevant theory of the case, you use that to have unity between you and your theory and the decision makers on it. Now on the next slide, you see there the big red gift and the reason I, I put up this um, public domain big red gift um, image is if there's one image that I want you to remember, it's again this idea that concessions are gifts. They trigger obligations, so be the first to give. And I think this comes back to the points we've made already, but that is recognize your weak points and, and be willing to concede on stuff so that you can gain your listener's willingness to then concede something back. And that would be your strong points that, that need their action back. And this gives you credibility. Um, it doesn't, it's not that you will always win because of it, but what you telegraph to the other side is that you're rational, you're reasonable, you recognize the strengths and weaknesses so that when you say, yeah, okay, that may not be the best thing, but this is good, you really believe it. As opposed to saying, every one of my arguments is great, they're all gonna win, your, your listener, your, it's either the opposing counsel, the judge, the jury, whatever, what you're telegraphing there is that you actually haven't really sorted it out properly, and so you're damaging your credibility. Um, <clears throat> this then brings us to what we've alluded to, and that is the strength of the speaker's personality. And, you know, you know, or you can see in the slide here, the heading is, what if I'm not Cicero? What if I'm shy? What if I'm introverted? What if I'm just not a public speaker? It's never been my thing, and I'm not good at it. 
And the answer is it doesn't matter. Personality type has a lot to do with your comfort level in communicating effectively, but it has less to do with one's ability to be a communicator. It's really about you and how comfortable you feel, but you can get over that. It's, um, and so we can't change our temperament, but we certainly can change our communication style. And the key point I think here is that the ability to persuade is something that we all have irrespective of these different personality traits. We don't have to be that perception of being Cicero or the alpha moot court um, person. It's about being yourself. And I'll give you an example here of one of the most profound experiences I had watching this theory play out in the real world is in my law school clinic many years ago, I had two students who <clears throat> were doing an appeal and they were going to go argue in the Ninth Circuit as third-year law students. <clears throat> and one of them was your prototypical like debater, public speaker, alpha, alpha male, banging the chest, moot court type of person. And the other wasn't even sure she could take the class actually. She had come and talked to me beforehand and was very, very shy, very introverted, didn't feel comfortable, had never done public speaking or debate, didn't do moot court in, in law school, didn't want to, and was unsure of, of whether, you know, as a shy, could more of a shy, introverted person, you know, not comfortable public speaking, could do it. So I told her, no, absolutely, of course, it's a learned skill. You can do it. If you invest the time, you will be able to do it, and you don't have to become like your opponent, who's just that kind of nat, your co-counsel, that is, your, who's that sort of natural, um, type A loud personality, you can be the most effective version of yourself, which will be an effective advocate. It may just be not what you're thinking it is. Well, you fast forward a year, we get to oral argument, and it's a brutally aggressive panel of judges, and the alpha moot court student gets up first and is your you know, traditional aggressive advocate arguing the panel is hyper aggressive back, and they are just at blows, and, you know, arguing over the case, and the panel's just launching in. And he's arguing back, doing the thing that advocates do. And so the second student then gets up and is very, very quiet, quiet and shy, s slightly slower sort of speech intonation, and not that aggressive personality. And the panel starts the same way they were with the first person, just <laughs> launching these loud, aggressive attacks. And this quiet, demure, calm um, person gives these profoundly powerful responses, but in a very calm tone of voice and a very reflective tone of voice, firm and strong in her positions, but very, very calm. She was being the best version of herself. And what was the most remarkable thing to witness was these judges who were leaping out of their chairs almost and were not paying attention to the first advocate who got up, who was just going blow to blow. After a couple of these attacks on her and then her noticeable response being noticeably different in terms of the tenor of communication, quite literally, without exaggeration, I watched as two of the judges just sat back in their chairs and one almost recoiled into his seat and just sat there and listened. Just listened and nodded. And that audience then was affected by the most powerful advocate in the courtroom, which was the quiet introverted student. And I remember sitting and watching, watching her argue and the hairs on my neck stood up because the oxygen was sucked out of the room by, by her presentation and the court just listened to her. Um, it was one of the most eff effective oral arguments I've ever seen, and it was a perfect example of this principle that we can all be the best advocate, we can all be the best persuader if we use these tools to improve our art form tied to our style. Don't try to be someone else. Don't try to fake it. She couldn't have gone up there and, and done that loud, aggressive thing. It wasn't her personality, but she could be as good or better being her own personality. So. Down here you see these little boxes. Um, these are things that are relevant to this idea that you be yourself and you'll connect to your audience better. Um, and these are just some tips to, to take with us. It's, emotion is important and it's critical to use carefully to win arguments. So you don't want to overuse it, but you do want to use it and you want to use it properly. A bored decision maker is a disaster. You have to engage with your decision maker and not let them be bored. Now, this is the other important point. Delivery cannot substitute for substance but substance alone cannot be the end of your advocacy. And this is a really important point. Obviously, you can't get up there and not really know your facts, not really know your law, but think you're gonna do some Clarence Darrow thing and sort of wow the, wow the judges or wow the jury. It's not gonna work. Um, the flip side's also true. You can't simply be really, really smart about the facts and law and have given no thought or effort to your delivery, to how are you gonna argue the case to the judge, 
or if it's a jury to a jury, a panel of judges, if it's an appeal, a private arbitrator, you have to have these tools we've been talking about in your toolbox to be a better persuader. Eye contact matters. Eye to eye contact, it does matter. All the science has shown that it matters and it matters for your ability to be a better persuader. And then finally, brevity. Don't waste your audience's time. Brevity is one of those key tools that you can use to say what you have to say and then be comfortable if there's a silence and there's nothing more to say, it's okay. You don't have to fill your clock, your allotted amount of time, you know, with words for all of the minutes you've been given by the judge for your argument, for example. If you can do it in less time, you can do it in less time. And so brevity is valued by all decision makers. All right, so here you see on this slide an example of how even at the Supreme Court of the United States, your advocacy can change an outcome. And if you think about that, you're talking the nine smartest judges in the country probably who have, they only decide 70, 80 cases a year. There's nine of them. They've got the four, four brilliant law clerks you know, for each of them. I mean, you have a lot of horsepower, right? But even there, your advocacy can actually change an outcome. And this comes from, this is a quote from Chief Justice Rehnquist, and it's a really powerful quote where he makes clear that oral argument can make a difference. There are cases where advocates get up and actually make a difference in terms of the outcome of a case. And that's even with all the horsepower being, brain power being brought to bear on it. And so the reason I put this up there and I highlighted it in different colors is the if we unpackage what Chief Justice Rehnquist is saying and we talk about it through the prism of advocacy and persuasion, when he's talking about speaking for myself, I think it does make a difference. He's talking about the audience. Like, who is the audience? Let's understand our audience. He is the audience. And he, re he is saying that advocacy can make a difference. But what he's also talking about is credibility. And what he's saying is he can leave the bench feeling differently than when he came to the bench. It's not always a 180 degree swing. It's more likely to occur in areas of law where he's left least familiar. If you unpackage that, what he's talking about is credibility, the, the ethos of the advocate who got up and was able to perhaps not shift him 180 degrees, but shift him a little bit. And the logic of this, the logos, that if you tie the credibility to the logic here, is that it's areas of law where he's less familiar. And so you as an advocate, if you are the expert on the, the copyright issue and on the law and you're deep in the weeds on copyright law, it's where you live as a lawyer. The nine justices at the Supreme Court obviously don't, but you can have credibility as an advocate if you really understand the law and you understand the deductive and inductive reasoning that you've been using to explain to the court what the law is. That advocacy can make a difference in some cases. And so the point here is that if advocacy can actually shift a Supreme Court of the United States justice um, then advocacy can, can be learned and it can be done by us in ways that are even more powerful and effective in all the other courts of the country. And so the point here is, what did he not say? What's not in Justice Rehnquist's quote there? What he didn't say is that the advocate who did this also was Clarence Darrow or Cicero or Winston Churchill or Abraham Lincoln. He didn't say that. It's the lawyer showing up being the best version of themselves um, that becomes the most effective advocate. So these last two slides are some quick do's and don'ts for when you're engaging at least in oral advocacy and oral persuasion. And these are sort of do's and don'ts for all time. And that is answer directly, don't give evasive answers. Look for the narrowest basis to win. Listen to the question and let the judge finish before you, inter before you, keep, you, know, you interrupt the judge and keep going. And you have to know your argument. You can't read from a prepared statement. And those are these basic do's and don'ts. If you stick with that, that is part of the tool the, you know, the, the, sh the shaping of the, of the product you're creating, your advocacy, you're using those tools by doing these things to get prepared. Now, here's the other thing, and we're in this post-COVID-19 technology age where we will be using technology more. And so here are some do's and don'ts that I think are really useful for you to become a better advocate, for you to master the art of persuasion more where you only have a camera to mediate you in the court. Turn off all the ambient noise sources. That's really important. Don't leave Siri on, that's a mistake. Um, Pause after your major points a little bit longer than perhaps you would when you're person to person talking because you've lost that ability to read body language. And what you don't want to do is just be over a camera constantly speaking without coming up for air. The other thing that I think is important when you're doing this over technology is to speak a bit slower. Enunciate even more because mumbling and jumbling or speed speaking doesn't work as well in general, but it certainly doesn't work as well over technology as perhaps it can work in a courtroom. Also, because you don't have your ability to use your body language as much, you want to use your other muscle, your voice. So get your speech varied and use inflections and patterns and those things we were talking about earlier, 
earlier today in the program in terms of the in terms of the the different rhetorical devices to be better and then use extra vigilance in listening or watching for the judge's voice i mean you have to be careful that you're not just listening to yourself give a speech so our conclusion we all can lend brilliance to our style all these tools matter the key point of course that has been running throughout this whole program is that perception is not deception we can be better versions of our advocate selves without having to change personalities if we practice these skills but this is an art form that can be perfected and made better you can we can always be perfecting upon where we were as an advocate and we can get better at it so you have to just keep in mind that we're not looking to learn the art of deception it's about persuasion and being better as an advocate Storytelling and credibility are the two most critical elements probably that distill from that three-legged ethos, pathos, logos tool we talked about. Remember to, to go back to the tools of logic that we, all, that we learned when we were young lawyers, but go back to them. Be careful not to fall into the, to the traps that we talked about also. And here's the final point. Yes, persuasion's an art, but it's also woven with science. And so I think if we respect both sides of that persuasion coin, the art side and the science side, the art of persuasion is there for you and it can lend brilliance to your style. Thank you.